plan. Uh, can I share it now? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay. Here it goes. Um, so just to repeat, my paper is entitled uh, From Kolikata to Calcutta, Reading Religion and Politics of a Colonial City. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, Nobel laureate and arguably the best known Anglo-Indian writer who extensively wrote of mountains, forest and the local people of Shimla, which is a small station at the foothills of the Himalaya, uh, deplored his visit to the famed Calcutta, which was the port city of the East India Company and thereafter the capital city of British India. In his novella, uh, The City of Dreadful Night, uh, published in 1899, Kipling describes Calcutta thus, I quote, the damp drainage soaked soil is sick with the teeming life of a hundred years and the municipal board list is choked with the names of natives, men of the breed, born in and raised off this surfeited muck heap. The narrator engages in an elaborate denunciation of the cityscape, especially at nighttime, which is the hour of the burglar, the prostitute, and every possible unholy being of the haunting threat of cholera and malaria and the lurking fear of smoke rising from its congested, dimly lit lanes. Soon, the novella becomes a voyage into the night. The very air of the city forebodes death, he remarks, upon suffering, I quote, the gross darkness of the night in evil, time-rotten brickwork, wherein it seems that people do continually and feebly strum stringed instruments of a plaintive and wailsome nature. Uh, it is noteworthy throughout the novel that for Kipling, as was the common assumption in his time, Calcutta the city began and ended in the colonial present. He quotes a poem by James Thompson on which the novella is named. Uh, and since they cannot spend or use aright the little time here given them in trust, but lavish it in very, undel very undelight of foolish toil of trouble, strife, and lust, they naturally claimeth to inherit the everlasting future, that their merit may have full scope and surely is most just. Thompson's poem arguably refers to the toiling people of London, but when Kipling superimposes this image of English decadence on the colonial city, it obfuscates the pre-existing occupations of the city dwellers under what he calls the muck of a big city. For Kipling, Calcutta had no past, no pre-colonial identity to boast of, except dense tropical forests impervious to the sun and disease-ridden swamps. Its future was at best bleak in its infestation of the toiling multitudes with no vision of modernity. By pointing to the land's existing heritage surrounding a temple of the Hindu goddess Kali, I will argue that Kipling's novella inadvertently denotes how the metaphor of nighttime is intricately linked to the city's socio-religious history. My aim is not only to point out the inherent complexity of the post-colonial modern city, but also to read the persistence of historical residues in such narratives which ostensibly erase pre-colonial histories. The city of Calcutta officially began to shape up as a modern city when the East India Company obtained a farman or a license from the Mughal emperor in Delhi to be zamindars or the landowners of three villages in the swampy coastal region of Bengal. In 1960, Job Charnak, the company chief, set up the first British settlement supposedly attracted by the cloth manufacturers there. The evidence of it being a major handloom center already and the presence of long reigning merchant families in the area is enough to prove Charnock's own comment and exaggeration that the place was, I quote, little better than a hamlet, unquote. Dioni Moody argues in his extensive research on the famous Kali Ghat temple in Calcutta, the beginnings of the controversy over the foundation of the city that formed the core of modern day Calcutta. Members of the Savarna Rai Chaudhuri family were the zamindars of this area at the time of the Portuguese and English settlements. It was from this family that the Emperor Aurangzeb allowed the East India Company to purchase zamindari rights to the villages of Shutanuti, Kolikata, and Govindapur in 1698. Kali Ghat, which means literally the embankment of Kali, was thus already a temple city, a site where pious Hindus would travel as pilgrims for centuries thus making the site famous before any Englishman steps, stepped on its soil. 
My argument is not unique in the sense that the pre-colonial history of Calcutta has never emerged in scholarship, but rather in the persistent evidence of this history in literary texts that ostensibly eschew the same history. When Kipling's association of Calcutta with the night itself was not significantly different from the colonial association of darkness with the Orient, my emphasis would be on how Calcutta becomes the quintessential post-colonial city, precisely because of this mythic past, which could not be erased despite, despite the claim of founding the first modern city in the Orient. Thus, Calcutta would become a prototype of many such modern cities which, with many such haunting darknesses within, each with a history that resists erasure. Before looking into the mythic story of this especially sacred site, I will briefly introduce the goddess in question. David Kinsley describes her in his most exhaustive re research on Hindu goddesses, according to which the goddess Kali is the foremost manifestation of the eternal feminine power called Shukti in Hinduism. Her skin is pitch black as the night itself. She dances her furious dance on a moonless night with large eyes red with passion, a protruding tongue, also red with the blood of evil demons, naked except for a garland of severed heads and arms around her body, down to her belly protruding from a meal of all the wild things in the cosmos. She is the glorious knight. She presides over the cemeteries, is surrounded by her associates who resemble the undead, but belong to the sacred site. And she often stands over the body of her husband, himself the supreme god of destruction. Of the many unorthodox groups who considered this deity as their presiding goddess are tantric priests, thieves, cremators, and prostitutes, otherwise inhibiting the fringes of the Hindu professional and social hierarchy. I'm going to just show a few pictures, so please be warned that she's not exactly uh, beautiful in the conventional sense. Um, so this is the goddess, the image of the goddess at Kalighat, and this is the uh, general, uh, general way in which she is portrayed at Hindu homes. And this is the temple uh, in its present condition. Um, now briefly, the story of this particular Kali temple, which birthed Kali Ghat and thereafter Calcutta. A.K. Rai ascribes the name of Calcutta to the area which in a Sanskrit text called Pitomala is called Kali Kshetra or the land of Kali. The center of the Kali Kshetra is the exact spot where the Kali idol was found sometime between the 2nd century CE and the 16th century CE. Gordash Vaisak, on the other hand, argues that the name Calcutta, derived from the name of the goddess Kali, is only a rumor, even though he admits the intimate connection between Kali and Calcutta. This line of scholarship relates the origin of the name to the geography of the city, well-irrigated swampy lands extending from the Ganges River Delta of the Sundarban mangrove forests, further transformed into a riverine port by the British. This would be an etymological derivation from the Bengali Calcutta, or simply canals. In any case, it is certain that the name of the modern city Calcutta was imbued with popular consciousness of Kalighat, a site of pilgrimage which would certainly be populated by her devotees, the priests and the temple management and the traders and craftsmen who certainly proliferate around every major Hindu temple. To return now to Kipling's text, I will focus on the association of the metaphorical night of Calcutta with vice and death in this text, especially to underline the disparity in Hindu and Christian attitudes to the same. Having mentioned the city's ancient devotion to the goddess known for upturning the limits of virtue and vice, and for the iconographic confluence of dichotomies, I will point out how myth and history permeate the colonial cityscape, despite the claim of founding the city afresh. In a chapter wherein Kipling names what he calls a dainty inequity, what the Englishman commonly called notch girls, the author grapples with the confoundment of witnessing virtue and vice in the same figure of this woman. Bedecked from head to toe in sparkling gems and ornaments, exuding the height of refinement and elegance in her welcome of the most profane and debauched men who un uncannily speak English with unholy fluency from their brown mouths and who shower her with obnoxious amounts of wealth for her little antics. Interestingly, some of the famous Jhumur songs sung by these women were about Kali, although suggestively sung with dual connotations. For example, one of them begins thus, Magi minche ke chit kore phele diye buke diye che pa, which means the hussy has thrown the bloke flat on his back. This could be referring to Kali standing on her husband, as well as to the sexual domination of the prostitute. 
All this happens in one of those narrow alleys Kipling mentions throughout the novella, where, I quote, you could be clubbed, struck, or anyhow mocked, unquote. On the one hand, he admits that such beauty and splendor could inspire a hundred poems, but on the other hand, his Christian soul is repelled by the brazen licentiousness of what he perceives as elevated prostitution. And I quote, the affectation of excessive virtue by day tempered with the sort of unwholesome enjoyment after dusk, this loafing and lobbying and chattering and smoking, how many men follow this double deleterious sort of life? The policemen too have been engulfed in the duplicitousness of the city of darkness, for they only assist and protect the in interests of these women. Further on, the sordid quarters where the sailors come to sleep are filled with blurry faces of mixed races and irreverent prostitutes who artfully evade questions. The same laxity of morals and impudence makes the city so post-colonial in its modernity because of the constant awareness of the laws, both civic, both civic and moral, which makes their open flouting so discomforting in Kipling's eyes. Towards the end of the novella, he moves deeper into the realm of death. Death in question is that of an English woman whose grave he visits at the Park Street Cemetery, also in Kolkata, once uh, dedicated to the Anglo-Indians and colonial officers, now closed and abandoned. He visits a certain Lucia's grave with a tombstone engraved with poetry. Lucia has fallen sick with putrid fever, typically ascribed to malaria born of the swampy waters. Despite being treated with hot curries and mulled wine with spices, she closed her eyes on the very, very river. Surprisingly to Kipling, even this symmetry bears the air of being older than it really was. And I quote, once again, the sightseer stands in the heart of utter desolation. The guidebooks will tell you when the place was opened and when it was closed. The eye is ready to swear that it was as old as Herculaneum and Pompeii, unquote. While Kipling's text does not fail to perceive the city's ancient inclination to a morbid aesthetics of darkness, he can only interpret it in terms of the decadent images of London, perversions to be abhorred and if possible remedied. In calling Calcutta the city of the dreadful night, Kipling thus upholds more of its mythical past than he intends to, as the metaphors of darkness, death and destruction persist in his text as much as the 19th century alleys of the colonial city if only to confound his sensibilities. Between Kolikata and Calcutta, the religion and politics of a city alters in text but refuse to die out, persisting in the everlasting future that Kipling is so skeptical about. The same that is promised by the goddess Kali each time she dances on the half-decayed corpses of the crematory. That's all, folks. Uh, now I'm trying to... Stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ashmita. Uh, okay, wonderful. Uh, perfect timing. And I think without further ado, uh, let's go to our second presenter, who's John, John Webley, uh, who is a joint PhD candidate in Slavic languages and literature and history of art at Yale University. Uh, so John is currently writing his dissertation on imperial discourse in 19th century Russia, specifically reflections of India and the great game in literature and painting. John's first publication examines the artist Vasily Bereshagin and uh, his depiction of India. John is currently a Stanford US Russia Forum Fellow. And in 19, uh, uh, 2019, he was awarded the Catherine uh, Davis Fellowship for Peace to pursue advanced Russian language study at Middlebury College. Today's presentation of John is gonna be entitled Magical Modernity and Colonialism in Google's Christmas Eve. Thank you so much, Dr. Mazwet, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Ashmita, for a really uh, interesting talk. I have yes. questions I'm already excited to ask. Me too. All right. So with that, let me just full screen. The day of Christmas Eve, everyone can see this, right? OK. Yes. The day of Christmas Eve ended, and the night began cold and clear. The stars and the crescent moon shone brightly upon the Christian world. The night was so quiet that one could hear the snow squeak under a traveler's boots from half a mile away. So begins Nikolai Gogol's fantastical novella, Christmas Eve, 
Published in 1832, the novelle is a part of Gogol's collected stories depicting life in rural Ukraine, entitled Evenings on a Farm near Dekanka, which made the author an overnight celebrity in Russian literary circles. Oops, sorry. The placid image Gogol conjures up was common in 19th century Russian literature, the Ukrainian countryside as a sleepy provincial backwater. Such visuals are a well-worn motif in imperial poetics, the depiction of peripheries as slumbering backward spaces that need to be awoken and modernized through colonial intervention. But Gogol quickly deflates this notion with abundant, absurd activity. A witch rises skyward on her broomstick, a devil steals the moon from the sky, and raucous revelers carouse and carol on the earth below. Life in this Ukrainian village brims with activity at night. The people do not need the Russian Empire's civilizing, modernizing intervention. As Gogol reveals, life in this Ukrainian village has a natural rhythm guided by the flow of the seasons and the movement of celestial bodies, which is distinct from the pace of the proto-capitalist metropole, St. Petersburg. Gogol thus presents the political integration of Ukraine into the Russian Empire as deleterious, a monotonous modernity threatening to supplant the local culture and economy. In this paper, I examine how Gogol visualizes this dynamic through the motif of nocturnal illuminations. Gogol associates artificial lighting, namely the street lamps of St. Petersburg, with deception and the demonic, which dehumanize everything in their aura and infect every one they touch with a mania for money. The moonlit nights in Ukraine, however, are a time to celebrate authentic Ukrainian lifeways, a pre-modern world where carnivalesque carolers go about town singing in exchange for gifts, an economy of charity and mutual care rather than consumerism and greed. But Gogol complicates this counter-colonial narrative. Throughout the story, he interrogates the role of the artist in navigating the cultural politics of empire. Christmas Eve's protagonist, the icon painter and blacksmith Vakula, becomes a stand-in for Gogol, the writer. By the story's end, Vakula has sold out his people's sovereignty to the empress. Gogol asks, has he also sold out Ukrainian culture to imperial audiences? Has he made his culture into something to be consumed? By recognizing that Gogol is not merely criticizing imperialism, but also his own role within it, I hope to nuance current debates about whether Gogol is a Russian or Ukrainian national writer an imperial poet or an anti-colonial subaltern mocking power. The narrative is set in motion when the devil appears in the sky above a Ukrainian village where he steals the moon. This upends Christmas celebrations as nobody can see their way around. The devil's motive is simple. He wants revenge on the blacksmith Vakula for painting some unflattering icons of him. At the same time, Vakula is attempting to earn the uh, love of the village beauty. Her cost? She demands that Vakula acquire a pair of the Empress's slippers for her. Vakula manages to capture the devil and conscript him into this quest. Uh, the two fly through the night sky to St. Petersburg, whizzing past stars, wizards, and demons. Despite all the mystical hijinks happening at home, Vakula is far more terrified of the city, which appears brighter to him than the day in his little village. The city's artificial lights are at turns seductive and terrifying, estranging the world and making the pious Vakula greedy for earthly wealth. Jonathan Crary and Wolfgang Schivelbusch have argued that new lighting technologies played a pivotal role in shaping modernity by creating, quote, alternate temporalities. Pre-modern agricultural communities, like the village in the story, lived according to, quote, cyclical temporalities, whether seasonal or diurnal, end quote and labor was constrained by the hours of natural light and the availability of candles or oil lamps. The introduction of brighter, more efficient lamps and street lighting in the 18th century dramatically changed these conditions, allowing people to both labor and consume late into the night, disconnecting life from natural cycles. In St. Petersburg, this process began in earnest in 1720, when the first order for urban street lighting was placed. By 1803, the city had 7,000 lamps. Gogol's texts reiterate the transformative power of artificial light, which profoundly distinguished the unnatural pace of life in the metropole from that in the rural landscape. Several scholars have commented 
on the tension between the rural and cosmopolitan in Gogol's Dekanka tales, as well as the importance of nightscapes and artificial light. Edita Boyanovska has suggested that the Dekanka tales were, quote, a major fictional manifestation of Gogol's Ukrainian nationalism that springs from an anti-imperial impulse, end quote. Boyanovska ties this to Gogol's descriptions of nature, showing that nighttime is coded as Ukrainian, a distinct and rebellious ethnicity within the empire, while daytime is Little Russian, a pejorative for Ukrainians that reduces them to mere children of Russian culture. Mikhail Epstein, uh, meanwhile, has connected Gogol's descriptions of glittering lights with the demonic, highlighting the frequency of such imagery in descriptions of St. Petersburg. Framed between Epstein and Boyanovska's work, the lighting technology seen in Christmas Eve become ominous symbols of an encroaching proto-capitalist consumer culture, which have the demonic power to transform the Ukrainian night into Russian days. Gogol's Ukraine is att uh, attuned to the rhythms of night and day, but this lifestyle is threatened by magical and mundane forms of pollution. At the beginning of Christmas Eve, we encounter villagers whose holiday plans depend on favorable uh, conditions of visibility. Quote, the moon majestically ascended into the heavens to shine down on good people and the whole world so that everyone could rejoice in caroling and praising Christ. But nature's ability to illuminate is threatened by supernatural forces, stand-ins for modernization and colonization. First, there is the witch whose journey into the sky to steal stars begins with a belch of smoke from her chimney. Her house is filled with coal used by her son, the blacksmith and presages the kind of pollution promised by industrialization and factories, although these were still totally undeveloped in Russia at this time. This slippage between magical and mundane pollutants occurs again later when the devil steals the moon. The devil then hides in a bag of coal, which the blacksmith carries around, himself unable to distinguish the devil from the combustible material. But perhaps the most obvious indication that these magical beings represent colonial modernity is the fact that the devil resembles both, quote, a German and a provincial solicitor in Gogol's words. That is to say, the devil looks like an ethnically ambiguous bureaucrat, a representative sent from the metropole to police the peripheries. The devil's attire can be connected to Gogol's initial impressions of St. Petersburg, as described to his mother in a letter he wrote shortly after arriving there. In general, each capital is characterized by its nation that casts on it an imprint of national character. But in St. Petersburg, there is no character whatsoever. Foreigners who settled here no longer resemble foreigners, and the Russians, in turn, became neither one nor the other. There is no spirit in the people. For Gogol, St. Petersburg was a city defined by the indeterminacy of its ethnicities and its host of petty functionaries. This combination is projected onto the devil's clothes, one half of which is vaguely foreign and the other a government official. The arrival of the devil in Dekanka, along with his curious sartorial choices, portends the appearance of metropolitan values in the village and the sublimation of Ukrainian culture. The natural rhythm of life seen in Dekanka is upended in the metropole, as Vakula learns. Along his journey through the sky, everything is visible, and he is even able to notice such unusual sights as a sorcerer sweeping by on a whirlwind or spirits in a cloud. But these strange visions are far less uncanny than the vision of St. Petersburg, marked by constant references to its glowing flame-like appearance. When Vakula approaches the city, it is sparkling like a flame, and as he gets closer, there is a sudden inexplicable illumination, perhaps fireworks or other festive lights. The buildings seem to glare with fiery eyes, and he even wonders to himself that nighttime in St. Petersburg is somehow brighter than daytime in his village. In Christmas Eve, St. Petersburg is a proto-capitalist nightmare hellscape where constant illumination has made it possible for people to labor and consume without need for rest or cessation. Upon arriving, Vakula is struck by the hustle and bustle of carriages and carts zooming along city streets, and notices the numerous men in expensive fur coats whom he thinks all resemble government officials. Moreover, all this illumination makes it possible for him to adopt a particular mercantile mode of perception. When Vakula arrives at the palace, he is initially struck by its splendor or sparkle. 
This brilliant light allows him to marvel at a painting of the virgin child, but his religious sentiments, hitherto a defining part of his character, quickly dissolve uh, and give way to fiscal ones, and he begins speculating on the value of the painting. He continues this sort of estimation throughout the palace, trying to guess the cost of doorknobs and other metalwork. Certainly in the Ukrainian village, this is not the case. Christmas carolers go around singing for free and in return are presented with gifts. By the demonic city lights, Vakula is able to set a price on everything he sees, integrating him into the proto-capitalist world. Vakula also makes a transaction while in the capital, exchanging Ukraine's independence for a pair of Catherine the Great's shoes. This moment brings together the story's capitalist and colonial threads as the Ukrainian gives up his power of self-determination in order to be integrated into the empire's economic system. Vakula's foolish trade is not a lone instance of an innocent Ukrainian giving into the temptations of empire either. Rather, it is the culmination of a motif that Gogol has steadily built up throughout the narrative. Um, these metropolitan values take clear shape when the narrator digresses from his account of the devil's exploits to discuss local fashions in the Ukrainian provinces. Quote, earlier it happened that the judge and the mayor used to dress up in wintertime in fancy fur coats, while all the petty bureaucrats were simply naked. Now the assessor and the junior magistrate have new lambskin coats for fabric covers. The region's uh, residents, especially bureaucrats, are deeply invested in dressing up, buying and wearing clothing that integrate them into the Russian government. Life in this Ukrainian village is not the sleepy world imagined by Russian imperial literature, and its nocturnal demons are far preferable to those created by the brilliant flames of modernization. Despite Gogol's preference for the traditional way of life in Ukraine, however, he is sensitive to the fact that this world is quickly vanishing. Moreover, it is not colonial violence that is destroying the way of life, but rather greedy consumerism and the drive for success in the new imperial order. This greed and desire for success is something perhaps that Gogol himself felt acutely, given his intense desire to appear well-dressed and become famous when he first arrived in St. Petersburg in 1828. I have a little bit more, but I think I'm short on time. So thank you. And, and you can wrap up, John, if you want, uh, just a, a minute or two, if you would like. Okay, I have one paragraph left, so. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Uh, Gogol does not tell readers just how this consumer culture will reshape life in rural Ukraine. Instead, he shows us the two choices facing his people. When Vakula returns home, triumphant with the Empress's slippers, he goes to present this gift to his paramour. But in his absence, she has abandoned her materialism and embraced authenticity, and tells Vakula she does not need the used slippers. Instead, only his kiss is needed to make her face, quote, light up. But Vakula must also appeal to her father to see if he will approve of the marriage. The father accedes to this request, but only because he is impressed by Vakula's new clothing. The father, quote, thought for a moment, looked at the hat and belt. The hat was wonderful and the belt was no worse. Good, send for the matchmakers, end quote. Gogol's story thus ends on an ambiguous note. We can be certain that the future promised by the metropole is an infernal one but like all things devilish, it may prove too tempting for the people of rural Ukraine and Gogol himself to resist. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, John. A beautiful, very interesting, both uh, Ashmita and John. So um, let's go to our uh, next presenter, uh, Mara. So Mara received her PhD, Mara Arts, received her PhD from Burke, uh, Burke, Burke. Uh, University of London in uh, 2020. She's due to publish a monograph based on her PhD uh, thesis entitled Interwar London After Dark. Uh, in her research, Mara concentrates on 1920 and 1930s uh, British cultural history with a particular fo focus on films and newspaper history of that time period. So today's presentation from Mara is entitled Representations of Policing and Nocturnal Crime in Interwar British Films. Mara, you have the floor. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, John. I really, really enjoyed your paper. Um, now add that to my list of things to read. <laughs> Okay, Let's see, am I sharing full screen? I'm not. There we go. Right, so um, 
thank you, Alex, also for that introduction. So um, this paper considers the representation of policing and nocturnal crime in interwar British film. And I'm going to compare that with representation of police in popular newspapers of the same period. And this draws on the materials for my uh, forthcoming book called Interwar London After Dark. And I'm going to argue today generally that British films of the 20s and 30s represent nighttime leisure spaces as disruptive and the police as a stabilizing force in society, well equipped to manage and suppress any criminal activity. And this is despite the fact that in reality, uh, police management of nighttime crime came under close scrutiny in interwar Britain. The press and government had caused to hold the police accountable, whereas fiction films continue to present the police in a reassuring and flattering light. So most of the films representing nocturnal crime and policing in this period are set in London, so the focus of the paper will be on the capital and the Metropolitan Police Force. Of course, the interwar period didn't mark the birth of London's nightlife. People have pursued social and leisure activities after dark, at least since the early modern period. However, technological advances continue to make the London nights more accessible. And during the First World War, the Defence of the Realm Act, or DORA, placed restrictions on opening hours of theatres and other places of entertainment, which curtailed London's nighttime economy. So after the First World War, the relaxation of these restrictions led to a nightlife boom, which many entertainments on offer for Londoners. And with the boom in nightlife came an increase in public interest in the transgressive and licentious possibilities of the night. Nightclubs became one of the most recognisable spaces of London's nightclub economy in the 20s and 30s. And clubs themselves often operated illegally by serving alcoholic drinks after permitted hours. Additionally, increased cocaine use in the early 1920s linked London nightlife with uh, drug trafficking. So the policing of nightlife, nightclubs and drug dealers were priorities for London's police force for most of the interwar period. And in addition, the containment of prostitution was also a primary objective of the Home Secretary and therefore of the police. So much of the prostitution in London took place on the streets and women who appeared to be soliciting custom were at risk of arrest. And as I'll demonstrate shortly, the policing of both nightclubs and prostitution came under close scrutiny in the interval period. Beyond prostitution and nightclubs, police forces, of course, also had to contend with assaults, robberies, murders, which would often also take place at night. But these types of crimes did not get much attention in films of the period, which instead favoured showing crimes which were either closely linked to the nighttime economy or criminal activity, which was actually completely um, imaginary and planted in the realms of fantasy. Going to the cinema was immensely popular in Britain between the wars. Um, British people at that time went to the cinema more often than people in any other country in the world. The cinemas received an estimated two thirds of the nation's total spend on entertainment activities. And it was not unusual for young working class Britons to go to the cinema multiple times a week. So I'm using film and cinema here as a case study to argue that what was shown in cinemas had a kind of disproportionate effect on how people perceived the society around them. So during the interval period, the Metropolitan Police reputation for trustworthiness and respectability was challenged by a series of scandals which were all concerned with the way the Metropolitan Police um, policed nighttime vice. So throughout the 1920s, concerns were raised about the Met's tactics for questioning suspects, particularly if they were female. And historian John Carter Wood has explored how police were criticised for ex exercising so-called third degree questioning, which involved placing suspects under considerable psychological black pressure during police interviews. And some instances of this were reported in the first half of the 1920s, but the matter was pushed into prominence in 1928. In March of that year, newspapers reported on the third degree questioning of Beatrice Pace, who was interviewed after her husband had died under mysterious circumstances. Pace was acquitted of murder a few months later. Shortly after the Pace arrest, police arrested 22-year-old Irene Savage on suspicion of soliciting in Hyde Park in the evening. It transpired that her male companion was actually a well-known Labour Party member, politician, which ensured the case garnered lots of attention in the press. After the case was dismissed by the magistrate because it had been based solely on police evidence, Savage was questioned for five hours by the police and later accused officers of bullying her. The ensuing press outrage led to two parliamentary investigations and the matter got so much attention that the term savagery to describe brutal police questioning actually briefly entered the popular lexicon. 
Before the parliamentary investigations of the Savage case had a chance to start, however, yet another scandal developed. In July 1928, a 21-year-old woman called Helen Adele was arrested at night by two police officers and charged with insulting behaviour and breaching the peace. However, according to Adele, police officers actually propositioned her rather than the other way around, and they even tried to sexually abuse her. The story could be corroborated by witnesses, and the two officers were brought to trial. They were found guilty, dismissed from the force, and sent to prison. So this string of scandals really damaged the Metropolitan Police's reputation, and a picture started to emerge of a police force that was unchecked and increasingly felt able to dispense justice by its own standards, without apparent fear for repercussion, particularly in cases of alleged sexual transgressions which took place at night. And in all cases, the behaviour and decision-making of ordinary patrolling officers were questioned and challenged. So the late 1920s saw a peak in negative press reporting on police activity, and in all these scandals, it was the police's actions at night which were under scrutiny. So how did this impact the you know, representation of police officers and nocturnal crime on film? So British films of the interval period, both criminal activity and the police are very closely connected with the night. Um, and the Metropolitan Police is the single most visible organization active at night in British films between 1919 and 1939. So for this paper, I've looked at 80 films that feature nighttime London and 45 of them contain police officers working at night. So it's 57% of the films that I looked at. More significantly, when criminal activity takes place on film, the police always make an appearance. Regardless of what type of nocturnal crime is on display, police always play a role in detecting it or punishing it. It's extremely rare for criminals to get away with crimes on film although there are some exceptions which I'll touch on at the end of the paper. Generally speaking, no matter how clever the cinematic criminal, the police end up capturing them. It's simply not possible for British films of the interval periods to show crime that went unchecked and unpunished. So one common type of criminal activity in the films of this period is the operation of international crime networks or gangs, the members of which naturally use the cover of darkness for the criminal deeds. So this is the kind of fictional crime I touched on earlier. In Laburnum Grove, which is a film I'll refer to in more detail later on, the main character is part of a network of money launderers. In both Bombs Over London and Sabotage, shady networks of arms dealers attempt to disrupt British society and start wars. And in The Dark Eyes of London, a master criminal uses a charity home for visually impaired people as a front for a criminal organization. Even comedies such as Bulldog Drummond and Trouble Brewing feature criminal gangs in secret lairs. And as Christine Grandi has noted in her book, Heroes and Happy Endings, quote, the dastardly deeds and behaviors of villains in the 1920s and 30s took forms that emphasized not just greed, but a betrayal of Britain, end quote. In British films of the interval period, crime was regularly used as a signifier to air anxieties about Britain's place in the world. Beyond the popular motif of the crime network, British films also regularly represented criminal behaviour which was explicitly linked to the nighttime economy. So cocaine, for example, deals with the dangers of drug use and illegal nightclubs. Maisie's marriage sees the heroine dragged into prostitution after she loses her job. And again, the setting, uh, setting for this behaviour is a dingy nightclub in Soho. Piccadilly elevated the nightclub setting, but still linked the nighttime economy to both drug use and murder. Although British films of the period often depicted nightclubs and restaurants and other nighttime leisure spaces, these spaces were usually shown to be closely linked with criminal or otherwise undesirable behaviour rather than as purely enjoyable locations. So none of the films portray police officers who are corrupt or transgress beyond the bounds of their duty. The real life scandals referred to earlier were not reflected on film. So it's partly due to the censorship of the British Board of Film Censors, the BBFC, to which all film scripts had to be submitted ahead of production. The BBFC primarily censored on grounds of morality and saw its role as protecting young and impressionable viewers from potentially damaging content. As film historian Geoffrey Richard has noted, quote, the rule which effectively banned attacks on the established institutions of Britain provided powerfully for the maintenance of the status quo and all that that entailed, end quote. There was no scope um, under the film censorship system to criticize police forces. Instead, they are portrayed as operating effectively to rid society of crime. So some films of the period are straightforward whodunits, where the criminal act and the hunt for the criminal form the focus of the narrative. In the 1934 murder mystery, Death at Broadcasting House, 
an actor is killed in the BBC radio studios whilst he's recording an audio drama. And Detective Inspector Gregory from Scotland Yard shows up and has to use his wits to figure out which of the actors has, has committed the murder. A more complex approach to inspecting is displayed in Liburnum Grove, which was released two years later in 1936. This film, an ostensibly quiet suburban family man, is in fact the linchpin to an international money laundering network. Mr. Ratfern uses the unassuming suburban locale as an effective cover for his criminal activities. However, Inspector Stack of Scotland Yard does eventually wisen up to Ratfern's activities, and he visits Ratfern at home in the suburbs and reveals that the police know almost everything about the criminal network and are poised to arrest Ratfern. The Burnham Grove ends with Ratfern hastily arranging for his innocent wife and daughter to leave the country, but also acknowledging that he himself is unlikely to be able to get away. The data broadcasting house and the Burnham Grove are but two of countless examples where a police officer leads the criminal investigation at the heart of the film. So other examples are Nightbirds, 1930, and the Arsenal Stadium Mystery and Murder in Soho, both released 1939. Another common trope in interwar British films was the investigation into a crime which was done by amateurs, but then handed over to the police. Um, at the end of the film, the police always has the monopoly on dispensing justice and crime. Uh, punishment. In the previously mentioned uh, Bombs Over London, which was released in 1937, two journalists investigated international gang of arms dealers who want to unleash a world war to make profits. At the end of the film, when the two journalists have uncovered the whole plot and found the organisation's headquarters, they inform the police who come in to arrest the criminals. The similar pattern, but in a comedy, plays out in Trouble Brewing from 1939. In this film, a hapless young man, played by the popular lecture comedian George Formby, is paid his bookmaking winnings in counterfeit money. Together with his female love interest, he sets out to uncover the counterfeiting ring. At the end of the film, the couple call in the police to arrest the criminals. So unlike the officers who interviewed Beatrice Pace or the officers who propositioned Helena Dell, police officers in interval films act appropriately and within the limits of their role. They only pursue genuine criminal activity and are usually successful in arresting the right people. The 1930 film Escape, an undercover inspector witnesses a prostitute soliciting a man at Hyde Park. The police officer does not attempt to arrest the woman straight away, but correctly asks the man to provide corroboration that he was being solicited. So police officers acting independently to arrest allegedly soliciting women based on police evidence alone had been a point of great difficulty for the Metropolitan Police only a few years earlier. An escape, the film, demonstrates the inspector acting absolutely by the book in that situation. In line with the BBFC rules, there was no appetite to challenge or undermine the police's image on film. As noted previously, generally speaking, the police will put a stop to criminal activity in interval films, but they and they arrest the right culprit at the film's close. An exception to this rule are some of the films made by Alfred Hitchcock in the early stages of his career. In both Blackmail, 1929, and Sabotage of 1936, a female character commits a murder for which she is not arrested. In both cases, the women have been abused by the men they kill. In Blackmail, the female protagonist is raped and kills her rapist in self-defense. In Sabotage, the female lead finds out her husband is, yet again, part of a large criminal organization, and that he has killed her younger brother by sending him on a dangerous mission. So when her husband starts making threats towards her, she kills him. So in both cases, there is mitigation for the women's actions. And in blackmail, a woman's boyfriend is actually a police officer. He's in incapable of suspecting his girlfriend of being a murderer, and the police investigation instead focuses on another man. This man ends up falling to his death from the British Museum, and the police consider the murder investigation closed. In sabotage, a police inspector has fallen in love with the female lead and protects her by hushing up her murder against her will. Although the women get away, um, without criminal punishment, which would have been the death penalty if they were found guilty of murder in the 1920s and 30s. The films imply that both women have to live with the lifelong guilt of uh, knowing what they have done. These examples can indicate potentially that Hitchcock's scepticism about uh, the police's effectiveness and the space he saw available for criticizing the police's functioning. It remains an exception, however. By and large, British films of the interval period showed the police to be functioning very effectively in the detection and prevention of crime. The representation of the Metropolitan Police Forbes in fiction films underwrites Lawrence Napper's contention that interval British films largely serve to reinforce the notion as Britain as an essentially stable society. 
Real life scandals that led to the public to question police methods did not have any significant impact on the treatment of police officers in popular media. The films also did not raise any concerns about potential structural issues with the governance of the police. During a period of political upheaval, with the increased popularity of communism and fascism on both the left and right of the political spectrum, the most popular mass medium of interwar Britain ensured that its outputs instructed audiences that that most unruly space, the London night, was ultimately governed in an ordinary, orderly manner by representatives of the British state. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. I was just sending you a little chat. Uh, so perfect timing. Thank you so much. A beautiful presentation again. And um, so our next presenter is Sikiru. Um, so Sikiru is a, a graduate student at uh, Ben Gurion University in Negev, Israel. Uh, he's a research fellow at the Center of Black Culture and International Understanding in Nigeria prior to his arrival uh, to the state of Israel. And that was very recent, if my memory is correct. His research focuses on newspaper, a crime, sport, youth, biography, Nigeria, and West African history. Sikiro's current research examines football history and culture as development model in Nigeria. Uh, today's presentation is entitled An Assessment of Nightlife on Obafemi Awo Lowo University, Ileife, in Southwest Nigeria, in time and space. Thank you. Uh, Sikiro, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm trying to share my slide. Yeah, right. Okay, sure. And Sikhe, well, we cannot see you. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but and it, it's okay. Uh, but okay. we can definitely hear you. And we can see the share screen. So okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my, my transition from Nigeria to Israel has actually uh, disrupt my research activities. And uh, my paper is not yet done. It's still a work in the progress. That's then fine. I have, uh, I have something to, to, to present. So I have my abstract, which is um, to offer, this article offers a new insight about nightlife of students. In a, con in a conventional tertiary institution in Nigeria. The article tries to assess the ways, forms, and manner through which students of the Abafemi University Ileve transact nightlife. It seeks to understand how students perceive night and various activities assigned to nightlife. It also examines the university management approach to security challenges associated with nightlife and safety of students. So I have my introduction, which uh, takes us back to the history of a tertiary institution in Nigeria. So we have the first um, tertiary institution in Nigeria established in 1948, which is known as University College Ibadan. So because Nigeria was actually colonized by Britain, the university was affiliated to University of London. But then by the time Nigeria became independent in 1960, it was, um, transfer to Nigeria and the idea of um, decolonization and Nigerianization of the university started. But then at the time the university was transferred to Nigeria government, we realized, you know, the, the then leaders realized that the university cannot serve the uh, increment in student enrollment into the university. And this led to uh, establishment of further universities such as Obafemi Aulawa University between 1960 and 1962. So we have Obafemi University located at Ilefe. We have Nigerian University, Nsuka, Ahmad Bele University, Zaria, and the University of uh, Lagos. So in 1975, um, the Obafemi Aulawa University is actually known as University of Ife, and it was regionally owned, not until 1975, when the military uh, administration uh, decreed that all regional university 
to become a federal university. And um, from, them, from the moment onward, the University of Ife became, uh, uh, became a federal owned university. And in 1987, the name of the university changed from University of Ife to Obafemi Aolo University in memory of uh, one of the uh, founding fathers of the university and a nationalist and a politician of note, Obafemi Aolo, or Chief uh, Jeremiah Obafemi Aolo. So the university was actually designed in such a way that it um, encompasses academic career, student hostel, and um, staff quarters for staff of the university. So today, the university has its central international markets where both the students and the staff patronize for their daily, for their ready-made uh, goods. The proximity of the student hostels, Angola, Aulawa, Fajui, Education Trust Fund, male, Mozambique, Morimi, alumni, and Akitola, which were meant for female, to the academic area, areas, uh, areas, community, however, enable students to engage with nightlife on the university campus for various purposes. So this article uses ethnography and uh, participant uh, observers approach to understand how students on Obafemi University engage with nocturnal time. So I try to move on to what exactly do students do on campus. So um, in one of the uh, studies on the, um, what students do on camp or what students do on campus at night, you can uh, assume assert that students usually begins. Uh, nightlife usually begins at uh, sunset, which is stays around 6 p.m. in the evening. So this is because this is the time students are putting the academic stress away in, in the meantime and getting ready for the grooves and frills to the, uh, of the cool evening. The student of Ophemi Aolo University, sorry, please. For students of our university, this marks the beginning of different activities for various students at specific um, venues. The relative electricity stability that the students enjoy on campus profoundly influence how. Sorry, please. Profoundly influence how students of the university transact night. Entering from the university main gate, which is known as Road One, the street light provide illumination for public and private commuters between the hours of 5 a.m. and 12 a.m. Although intra-campus transportation ends at 10 p.m., the proximity of the hostel, public spaces, and the academic environment enable students to move freely from one part of the campus to the other. Students converge at various at different venues on campus for their regular activities beginning from sunset till dawn. In some, in some cases, for instance, during the, exa during the examination or concert on campus, some of the popular places are Angola Mozambique Car Park, popularly refers to Anglo Moose, Morimi Car Park, Odudua Lecture Theatre, OGLT 1 and 2, Sports Complex, Student Union Building, and Buka. Student nightlife on Obafemi Aolawa University includes activities such as reading, religious engagement, party, business, and relationship. It is not clear how students transact night in the 60s and 80s. However, the liberalization of the country's economy and the introduction of structural adjustment program in several ways affected how students transact night in the 1980s and 1990s. The manifestation of religiosity that followed economic hardship in Nigeria found its way into the nation's ivory tower. It is, on, it is a common assumption among Nigerian students to bond Sorry.
Sorry, I actually mixed my, I actually mixed my slide and I'm trying to connect with it. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I cannot see any slides personally. I don't know how it's with everybody, but we have your screen shared. Uh, now? Uh, but we do not have the slides. You can just go on. That's all right. I think it's okay. Just go on, please. Okay. It is a common assumption among Nigerian students to burn the night candle during the examination. This set of students are categorized as akada. Most students prefer to go to academic areas for night reading in search of more solemn atmosphere. As electricity also becomes erratic, student hostels sometimes do not have electricity, therefore prompting students to look for area, areas with electricity. Religion has also impacted profoundly on how students transact night on Obafemi Aulawa University campus. Since the 1980s, religion has assumed a center stage in the everyday livelihood of the people of Nigeria. Both Islam and Christianity have contributed immensely to, religio to religious polit politicalization of the day-to-day -day running of the university. The emergence of student arms of religious organizations, such as the Muslim Students Society of Nigeria, MSSN, and the various Christian fellowships have dominated the landscape of student nightlife on Obafemi Aulawa University. It is estimated that there are over 100 Christian fellowships on OAU campus. Likewise, each of the student hostels, particularly the male, has its own mosque, in addition to specific locations on the academic area where Muslim students can observe their daily prayers. Under the illusion of machination against academic successes, Christian fellowships in different parts of the campus, including the hostel, sometimes hold night vigil because it is believed that the evil uses the night period to manipulate his victim. Night is also used for evangelism among the students. At the resumption of newly admitted students on campus, scramble for souls between the MSSN and the Christian Fellowship takes place at night. Depending on the schedule of each soul searchers, Committee on Evangelism move both male and female from one hostel to another in preaching and introducing the new students to their, to their denominations. Nominal Muslims or Christians who seek the evangelism, who see the evangelism as a form of new association sometimes becomes sometimes become a member. The possibility of conversion cannot be ruled out during the soul searching process. Few examples exist of students who convert from one religion to another. However, the extent of this conversion is beyond the scope of this uh, article. A new trend of behavior that has crept into nightlife on campuses is phone sex, which is perpetrated by students at odd hours of the night. The trend began in 2001 when the global system for, mo for mobile communication, GSM services providers introduced free night calls during which subscribers make free calls between 12.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. Prior to this period, Love, love, relationship, and sex are everyday lifestyle of students of tertiary institution. Though student and sexuality on university campuses in Africa have not received extensive uh, research, phone sex conversation takes place takes different different forms, including guided sexual sound, narrated and enacted suggestion, sexual anecdotes and confection, candid expression of sexual feelings and love and, and or discussion of, of very personal and sensitive um, sexual topics. The proliferation of mobile phones changed the pattern of nightlife from hangouts at places like Anglo Moose, Morimi and Student Union Building to phone calls. Never, nonetheless, 
The phone does not in entirety put an end to hangout. Rather, it facilitates easy access to lovers to meet at different uh, places. Students also engage in businesses at night. Some students engage in businesses as a means of financial sustainability. Students in this category are referred to as indigents who require financial support in their education pursuits. Leveraging on the population of students on campus, trading, trading of foodstuffs, clothing materials, shoes, and other items of student essentials are some of the activities that uh, students engage at night. Thank you. Thank you, Zikiru. Thank you very much. And sorry about the technical little issues, but uh, I think everybody understands when you move somewhere uh, so far and so different, it can be challenging. Um, so uh, our next presenter and our last presenter is Marjolaine Shepers. Uh, Marjolaine is a postdoctoral researcher in social history. She currently holds a, a postdoctoral fellowship of the Research Foundation Flanders in Belgium and, uh, and IAS uh, Fernandez Visiting Fellowship at the University of Warwick. Uh, her research focuses on migration history from the 1700 to the present and centers on questions of citizenship, dynamics of inclusion, exclusion, and infrastructures of migration and mobility. So the presentation uh, today for Marjolaine is entitled uh, hold on, let me, uh, is entitled Closed Gates and Dark Streets, Urban Spaces and Ar of Arrival at Night in Early 19th Century uh, Leiden. So Marjolaine, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much for having me and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Yes, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm presenting a part of my new research project, um, which is generally on, on uh, spaces of arrival and transit and infrastructures for migration. And within that project, I became very interested in um, the rhythm of day and night within these, these spaces and infrastructures. So I'm very happy to be here in this session with you all. Um, and um, it is also a work in progress presentation. Um, so I'm very curious to hear what you all think of it. But I wanted to start um, by talking about the changes um, of cities at night in the early modern period within, within history that we talk about. So um, historians like Kolosovsky, Casanova, but also Baldwin and more recently Arun Kumar have talked about how um, night used to be considered as private time of people. Um, and and people would do stuff in the house with their families. It was not 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 productive time. Um, and at the same time, um, how the night and we've seen this in other presentations as well had these sort of, um, especially in Europe, these connotations of of evil, um, of darkness, of danger. But how there were just some changes from the 17th century onward, with um, as also John has said, the uh, city lighting system that was installed in cities. Um, in, I'm working on the Low Countries, and there you have uh, Amsterdam was the first to install city lighting, and then the city of Leiden that I'm working on now um, quickly installed it soon after. But this sort of systematic city lighting meant that people, um, instead of when you would go out at night and make sure that you were being seen, so you'd make sure that you'd carry a lantern and other people would see you were not out to steal or to do anything considered dangerous or, or, or unsafe. Uh, instead, instead um, instead of people no longer presenting harm, it would be a general systematic system of lighting throughout the city. And several historians have called this um, nocturnalization of, of uh, middling classes and bourgeois groups going out more at night, um, leisurely activities at night, but also a colonization of the night, of, of the night becoming a productive time of people being uh, asked or forced to continue working at night. So I'm, I'm working on 18th, 19th century, and we are in this change of, of doctrinalization and colonization. Um, oh, I think I skipped a slide here. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, I'm working on, on places of transit, as I said, and my focus is on the low countries, so the Netherlands and Belgium, because this is a highly urbanized region at the time, and their focus on cities as sort of um, 
nodal points in their regional transport networks and so how people when they traveled uh, by boat or by foot or by uh, car with horse um, before the railways had to stop uh, in the city to either change uh, to a different form of transport or to stay overnight to rest a bit. And Leiden was one of the cities that was central in the uh, transport by barges, so transport over water. Uh, and it was not a city that knew a lot of immigration in the time period I study. Instead, it's a textile town in decline. Um, it knew quite some immigration in the 18th century. And there wasn't really immigration that much, not in a large scale at least, to the city in 19th century. And of course, when I'm talking about migration here, I'm also talking about short distance mobilities, uh, internal migration, not talking about um, what we now consider to be migration, which is international migration. I'm talking about all forms of mobility. And so for Leiden, I'll be talking today about transient migration, people making a transit stop, and sort of the liminal spaces that they uh, inhabit and, and participate in, in the city. And this is within the framework of migration histories. So I'm not in literature or film studies. Um, I'm a historian. And just for some background, how to situate my research. Um, I just talked a bit already about the definition of migration and mobility, that I'm not only talking about international migration, um, but we generally situate, we generally distinguish between migration as in people changing their residence uh, and mobility as in all forms of human movement, including uh, daily mobility from your home to your workplace um, or visiting family or, for example, peddlers or uh, other forms of itinerant migration, seasonal labor, merchants, um, all kinds of all kinds and forms of travel of people. And this research is uh, focused on 18th, 19th century also because there is a big discussion within migration history on whether the, the 19th century was a period of, of transition in mobility. So there were theories starting from the 1970s, uh, mostly by social scientists, that the, um, um, all over the world, migration and mobility increased considerably in the 19th century. And so we have this whole new unknown era of mobility, which we are still in, which should have started in the 19th century with the steamships going to other continents, with the trains going faster and further. But historians have strongly uh, criticized that idea um, amongst others, because sailors and soldiers um, already um, um, ages before were moving on large distances and establishing intercultural contacts and the knowledge between continents, between countries already existed, but also because of this, this um, shorter distance, but very regular mobility of, of rural communities amongst each other. But while we're still discussing what well, kind of, we're still discussing the numbers of the transition, but at the same time, we do agree that the 19th century, of course, sees the advent of the nation states, which means for a form of standardized documentation that people have to carry, uh, centralization of, of migration regulation, while also cities still remain important. And we have these transitions like urbanization, um, industrialization, which of course change a lot of the frameworks of um, mobility. But one of the main issues with studying this mobility transition is that the most most of the movements that people made in the past, of course, went unregistered. They were often only written down if they were considered a threat or a potential threat, potential problem for local authorities, or if someone could make money from them. But there's a lot of moves that we don't have an idea of. But then I want to understand more of people being on the road, right? And what, what this mobility was like. There is an, an interesting new development um, based on the spatial turn in humanities, of course which looks at um, spaces of arrival in cities, and then particularly the places where people who want to settle down in the city first arrive, um, where their uh, papers are being checked, the first houses they stay in before they continue and settle down. And so this, goes, this is about also a spatial perspective of the places that they would frequent, and then the space of arrival is a larger um, zone, their relation to the different neighborhoods and social functions of the city. And so I want, with this project, I'm proposing to take that a step further and not only look at spaces of arrival, but also spaces of transit um, and include also this sort of infrastructural um, focus on, on not only accommodation, but also the transport that people take, um, the policing, charity that people would be dependent on, or networks uh, that accommodate or regulate or stimulate mobility. And so I'm looking at spaces of transit and the infrastructures that, that sort of structure um, these forms of mobility.
As I said, I'm in history. My main um, research methods are historical research methods, and mostly in this case for this paper, mapping. Um, I'm experimenting with mapping the information from different registers, um, mostly from civil authorities, to try to understand um, yeah, sort of which are the infrastructures that limit, regulate, accommodate transient migrants, and also what are the kind of places that they would come in touch with. But also looking at the night, um, what kind of control was there? How well lighted was it? Were these spaces more in central public spaces or more in back streets? And I will briefly show you some maps that I'm, I'm currently making and then go on to some emergent themes from my research. Um, but if you have any questions about methods, please ask them later, I won't go into all the sources. So this is a map of the city of Leiden. Um, it's all written in Dutch, I'm sorry for that. I didn't have the time to translate all the labels into English. So you can go ahead and try to read them, but I'm not sure if everyone will understand. Um, but this map shows actually um, the labels in yellow, which means the night watch house. Um, so sort of the center where the people who, who conducted the night watch in the city, which was a sort of citizens initiative. Um, would gather and from where they would also walk out. But also it shows all the locations um, of inns, lodging houses, and places where inns were permitted. And so that's all in black and gray. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but basically up north was a stop of the barge going to um, Haarlem, I believe, and then in the west to Delft, and then in the east, the, the barge to Utrecht and Amsterdam. And you can see that these inns and lodging houses were generally located around these areas, but then also there, and there was also um, spaces where they were allowed, which was near the port, near these transit areas and near the markets. And what I found interesting is that the night watch is often it's not very clear in this map. I should, it a bit. Night watch centers were often located close to these spaces, um, close to what I would call the space of transit in the city, except for these two in the south, which are not very clearly related. And I think they're more related to the army barracks and the universities as spaces that would be controlled more. Now, here I took the night watch out, and so you can only see the inns, the lodging houses, uh, and the permitted locations for inns. And what's interesting is so these permitted locations for inns were mainly um, next to the transit transport stops, so north, uh, west, and east, near the port, uh, and near the markets. But then that was a register and regulations from the late 18th century, so from 1766 to 1801. During the French period, these were uh, abolished, no longer valid. But then I have sources from 1832 and another series of sources for the 19th century between 1816 and 1894. And what was quite interesting to see about them um, is that actually these inns and lodging houses are still sort of on the same spaces as where they were allowed formally to be uh, in the 18th century. I'm wondering whether that's the sort of path dependency of families who own them and, and continue them in the same spaces or, or um, the logics of transit uh, of people just arriving there and, and needing a space to stay there. And last map for today, um, this is a calculation I'm making um, based on city street grid. So it's a, it's a mathematical, um, theoretical calculation. It's not based on human movement. It's based on how easy it is to get from one street to the other. And so this interactivity map um, calculates which streets would be more frequented in theory, the red ones, and which streets would be more difficult to reach. And so generally quieter streets, the blue ones. And what's interesting to see is that the inns and the lodging houses and the spaces where they were allowed are either in these very highly interactive streets or in the back streets, in the more calmer streets. And that also corroborates um, with some research for Venice, for example, which shows that um, places where, for example, royal families or, or wealthy merchants would stay were generally on like the main piazza and in beautiful places. Um, and the other people would be more in back streets, often poorer neighborhoods, a bit more hidden away. So some of the things that I'm noticing while researching this is for one, the importance of the rhythm of day and night when analyzing mobility and transit. Um, every day upon sunset, the city gates would be closed uh, with a key. Someone would go out, close the gates, 
no one was allowed to enter anymore. There was one barge that was allowed per night to arrive after nightfall, but the costs for tickets for these barges were higher than for daytime barges. Um, every day, the city lights would be lighted also before sunset, and once again towards the morning to ensure they would be lighted all night. And inns and pubs are obligatory closing houses. Now, this rhythm of day and night was different, of course, in summer than in winter um, because of longer days, um, which also made that in summer the days were longer, more uh, barges per day were possible, but also people traveled more. Um, okay, I see that. I'm going to just wrap it up. Thank you. Um, use it two more minutes, yeah. People traveled more, uh, there was more work in summer. Um, and in winter, there were more seasonal complications, such as humidity, which meant that the boats would often slip up and would not be able to continue anymore. Also, in terms of rhythm of day and night, cities were often very much um, obsessed with uh, people that were not citizens staying overnight. They would either provide charity, hosting them in sort of hospitals or guest houses, or in terms of epidemics in other cities, we can see that no one from outside of the city was stay allowed to stay overnight. Um, 19th century, we we'll often see cities keeping lists of everyone and noting down as much information as possible so they could track them, so they could analyze whether they were a potential threat, whether they could become possibly dependent on the city. Um, and in Leiden, we see that there were very strict regulations on accommodation, like the spaces that I showed where um, lodging was allowed, but also um, only one person was allowed per bed. The beds could not be below floors, uh, like below ground, because that would be possibly uh, unhealthy. And so these kind of show um, notions of the danger of the night, um, but also the obsession with, with visibility and security when we talk about migrants. Um, the inns and lodging houses were supposed to have specific signs and lights at the window so that travelers could find them, but also so that people knew that this was a space of, of arrival or transit. Barges had to ring the bell upon departure. Um, I already talked about the locations where they in, were in. And so I'm starting to get interested in trying to analyze whether they are um, trying to contain or like make visible the transient populations it's to keep them in one space so that they knew where they were and could make sure that they would travel on. Um, and there's also charity that's arguing for that. There's a lot of questions for further research. I won't go too much into them. One of the things I'm doing now is mapping the locations of lanterns based on a register I have. Uh, I had hoped to finish it for today, but it was much more work than I thought. To try to see if these spaces of transit are dark spaces or light spaces. Um, I don't have the results right now. Just for some concluding remarks, um, I think this research, when advanced more in it, um, help us also to get gain some more insights into these conceptualizations of migrants as a possible threat that are that's a prominent discussion in literature. Um, some historians have said that migrants are considered a threat in, in early modern, but also 19th and 20th century societies and up to today, based on um, sort of the categorizations that they fit within. Now, by that, I mean, if there's a group that is um, relatively large, but mostly relatively homogeneous in, for example, gender, religion, age, or profession, this group is more easily considered a threat by local society than if it's a very heterogeneous group. And so I'm trying to place that in a historical perspective, but most of all, I'm trying to shift the focus from the migrants and their categorizations to the infrastructures accommodating them with this material spatial analysis. Um, which is a new approach to migration history. Within my field, we've mostly focused on, on social control on the one hand or the categorizations of migrants on the other hand, not so much on the agency of technology or nature uh, in these urban transformations. And then for cities at night, I think it will provide some more insights also into um, how to go beyond the resident community when, when studying cities at night and focusing on these liminal spaces, mobile people um, as sort of the users of public space. that Maybe we're not residents um, not a part of the community, but at the same time, as a whole, these transient groups were often always present in the city. So the individuals might not have been part of the community, but the transient groups were definitely part of the um, urban daily life. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Marjolaine, that's great. I think we can, um, uh, yes, hold on, I'm receiving a message. Um, 
I think we can, uh, yes, let's open the, the floor then to the questions. Very interesting presentations. Uh, and I do have questions, but I would like you first to have the floor. So is anybody, uh, anybody wants to start? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll avoid doing that thing, which is like throwing book suggestions at people. I won't do that. But I was wondering, Marlene, um, having heard John's uh, presentation, he obviously, John, you talked about um, industrialization, you know, rural versus urban, knowing that the Netherlands is very urbanized, but not very industrialized. Has this kind of maybe sparked some new thoughts um, for your research? Um, you know, like, is the city in, is laid and also kind of um, seen as maybe kind of, you know, imperial or colonial, but whatever that is in the, in the low countries context. Yeah, thank you. So the Netherlands was a, was a country to industrialize really late for European standards. Um, and also in terms of transport, it's interesting because it was also really late in having train and railways. So it continued to depend on, on uh, transport by water for a very long time. Whereas in Belgium, there was already a, a um, construction of a rail work well underway at the time. Um, and so it's been urbanized since like the medieval period onwards, we consider it an urbanized area, but the industrialization is much later. Then at the same time, Leiden is a colonial city in the sense that, of course, it's, it's a city in the Netherlands, which is a very, very um, colonial imperial country, but also it is a city of the university, um, which is something I would like to get it more into because it was the, it's the oldest university of the country. Um, it's a big university, and so it's also a university that has been um, crucial in, in, in developing this imperial propaganda, colonial propaganda, um, and the forms of research that are so connected to imperial colonialism. Um, I don't know to what extent there was also a lot of mobility from um, colonized people into Leiden. I know that there was, I'm, I'm not really researching that at the moment. Um, yeah, I've done, I've done another research on 20th century um, spaces of arrival, colonial spaces of arrival. So I'm trying to get make the link now, but that was in a different city in a different area. So I shouldn't go too far into it yet, but thank you. Uh, okay, I think Pella has a question. Yeah, this was, this was a great panel. I, I'm really, really uh, excited about all of this research. One of the things that I saw as a recurring theme of all of these papers was the asymmetricality of public space in a colonial setting and how, how the people that are sort of in this imaginary public, like going back to like a, a Habermas or Ben Hamin sort of definition, assumes a certain whiteness and assumes a certain maleness um, on some level of who is supposed to have access to space. And because of these in, the interventions that you did to like rewrite the history of these spaces, I'm curious if how you feel like that speaks to some of the conversations that we're having in these very same public spaces around policing, around access to public space in India and some of the other um, areas of research, how that speaks to our current moment. Uh, since you did mention India, I suppose I should begin with uh, this. Um, I do not suppose that um, at least uh, in, in the city that I mentioned in Calcutta, there was any emphasis of uh, maleness within the public uh, sphere during the night, because uh, mm, during the night, the curtains or the, the women, the dancing women, they held sort of like the center stage. And by this time, because it was uh, like the decay, de decaying of the Mughal culture, uh, that came before the British invaded India. So uh, they, by this time, were already quite rich. They acquired a lot of wealth. So these women were not really uh, poor or they did not have to depend a lot on men. In fact, that was, the, that was the objective, the motivation behind how they earned their living. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to be very independent. So uh, they also largely dictated how and what the police would do because uh, 
they often paid or bribed the police so that they could continue their activities uh, despite uh, legally uh, these activities becoming prohibited uh, with the British rule and the increasing emphasis on Christianity and things like that. Uh, but this thing continued uh, for quite a long time, well into the 20th century. And these uh, women, they only changed the name of their occupation. They began to call themselves entertainers uh, rather than prostitutes. Uh, but they did hold a lot of power within the city at night. I think maybe Mara also could say a few words about that, because Mara, you did address um, the, 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 the gender issue uh, as far as policing in London. So I don't know if you have a few words to add. Well, Paula, because you asked about how it speaks to the current moment, and what I'm thinking about, I don't know how familiar those of you who are not in the in Europe are about this, but early this year, a, a woman was kidnapped and raped and murdered by a police officer in the UK, uh, or in London specifically. So it feels to me that, you know, that... <laughs> it's not resolved you know the power imbalance is not resolved and I'm hopeful that we're getting there and then there's also the institutional racism of the metropolitan police which was invisible in the 2030s but obviously since the 50s 60s um and kind of is still ongoing so it, yeah it does it does speak to the current moment uh I'm not seeing maybe the I'm hopeful that there is uh, this is the the moment of change now in 21st century but I'm not necessarily convinced that it is mm -hmm. Yeah, I tend to agree. I, the, listening to everybody, I think, uh, you know, and you had kind of, it's not really contemporary, maybe uh, C.K. Ru is more contemporary, but uh, you you touch 17th century and Google 19th century, and it seems like it hasn't changed much. We still have a lot of policing, we still have a lot of this kind of, you know, the night is more magical, more devilish, more this and that. We still have kind of the same dichotomies in some ways. And I was wondering uh, for, I don't know, any, I don't want to take the floor actually. Anybody else has any other questions? Okay, there we go. So um, uh, maybe uh, Ashmita and then uh, Marjolaine. Uh, yeah, so I have a question for John, actually, and since uh, we are really curious about the devil, um, and I really like the illustrations, uh, especially that you chose uh, with the devil, uh, with the protagonist on the back of the devil. So I was wondering if um, uh, in this novella, which I have not read, uh, the devil has a character of his, uh, of his own, like does he speak or does he uh, become like a representative of the uh, ambiguity of the of the night, or does he represent uh, like Gogol taking one particular side in this ambiguity? So uh, thank you for the question. The devil does uh, speak throughout the story, and it's sort of important to know that in like uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and other Slavic folklore, like there are lots of little devils and demons. And so he's very mischievous, very like naughty, very flirtatious. He's like constantly trying to seduce the witch who is the mother of the hero. Um, and so he does speak, but what sort of defines him is this like being very much like a government official. Like I said, like he looks like a German, which sounds really weird, but you have to understand that in like 19th century Russia, the government was run by Germans and ethnic Germans. So for them, like looking like a German means kind of like, you kind of look like a foreigner, you kind of like act like an administrator and that's all we really know about you. But yeah, the devil has a very uh, distinct naughty personality in the story. Right, that's very interesting. I'd like to read the novel in future. Yeah, it's a fun Christmas time story. It sounds, uh, yeah, very interesting for sure. Uh, Marjolaine? Yeah, thank you. I had a question for Sigil because um, I found it really interesting to learn about the day and nighttime differences at the university campus. Um, and particularly, I was thinking about something I read. Um, so we're going to the literature recommendations slash questions as well, uh, which is um, an article by Avon Kumar on, on night schools in colonial India. And he talks about how, um, in a way, there was this reappropriation of the nighttime uh, as private time, but also as a time for personal development. And so there's this very, what I found very interesting in, in your paper was the connection or the distinction between both like more private functions of the night and public functions of the night. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit more about that. Both like the nighttime as, a, as both a time for, for 
going to the library or or, or religious um, um, moments or, or business, uh, the scramble for souls at night, and also the very private um, phone sex and other parts. So, so yeah, that public private distinction is fascinating to me, actually. Well, as far as um, Abafe Miaolo University is concerned, night is actually not private for students on campus, except for the staff who retire to their uh, staff quarters at night. For a number of students, a number of activities that go on on campus disturbs one another. And that's why I said that a number of times students who as a result of disturbances in their hostel will have to move to campus area and look for a solemn area where they can study. So, and because there is no regulation as to where can certain activities take place at night on campus. So it intersects into, uh, you, you are unable to differentiate between what is private and public at night. So that's exactly what happened on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, John, I think you also wanted to say something. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Sir Ashmitha. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this or if you think I'm like missing the mark, but I was struck in your presentation by the importance of gaze and visibility and how the British colonial gaze is like continually frustrated in Calcutta. Like night is this time that is inherently, uh, it inherently troubles our vision, but especially the colonial gaze that wants to be able to see everything it wants to police it. Um, and this panoptic gaze is threatened in a gendered and religious way by the figure of Kali. Uh, like the British might be able to see like a figure of Kali um, or her likeness, but they can't perceive her in a religious setting. So I'm thinking of darshan here and the importance of gaze in this ritual, which like the British, I don't think ever really grasped. Um, likewise, the British can see the notch dancer, but not other women in the city because of Purda. Um, and they also often fail to understand the significance of notch dancing um, and reduce it to just being a sexual thing. They don't sort of appreciate necessarily always the art in it. And then finally, there's the dead woman at the end of the story who also has become invisible to the narrator. So her death kind of parallels the way that like the colonial city always will hide, um, like hide the male colonial gaze, it seems like. Yes, yes, I agree completely. Um, uh, I think it does relate to the darshan. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, Kali, or for that matter, any uh, major god or goddess uh, uh, represents uh, this sublime um, feeling of uh, like getting to know the the ambiguities, the getting to transcend the dialectic, as it were. So uh, Kali's dance is a dance of destruction, but at the same time, there is the sprouting of life from within. And uh, as I said, uh, the husband on which uh, on who on who she uh, stands on, he is himself one of the trinity of the Hindu gods, and he is the god of destruction. So uh, the whole. Uh, atmosphere is uh, atmosphere generated by Kali and her husband Shiv. Uh, it's representative of one form of acquiring this uh, divine vision or darshan. Uh, so yeah, I think Indians um, or people who are acquainted with Hindu mythology would be very much aware of uh, the iconographic representation. Uh, but yes, of course, this is uh, largely uh, missed by uh, uh, Indological writers and uh, yeah, British authors in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, any other questions maybe? Um, Mar Marjolaine, your hand is still up? No, it's down now, okay. Okay, I have a question, I have many questions, but we're running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, but for Mara, Mara, you were saying that at that time, the time period you're, you're talking about, uh, the cinema was, um, people would go to the cinema, the London population was the one that was going to the cinema the most in the world, sometimes twice a week, I think you said. Uh, do you know why? So that's one question. And also I was wondering, was the cinema in that sense a, a, a medium of communication or, or kind of a pro propaganda tool um, more so than maybe the newspaper or the radio or any other kind of um, communication media? That's a second question. 
question. And the last question also from Era, Hitchcock, do you think that those uh, movies from Hitchcock partook or had, you know, some played a part in the fact that he became an extremely famous uh, director? So those okay. three. So first question as to why people went to the cinema so often. Um, I'm actually reading kind of oral histories currently of, of people who used to go to the cinema. Part of the reason is the film swapped all the time. So some cinemas swapped films two or three times a week. So you could go multiple times. And if the film has gone, the film has gone. So if you really wanted to see it, you had to go. Um, and it was very, very cheap. So obviously for people who not, didn't have much money, you could go to the cinema for you know a few pennies and sit there and you could stay for as long as you liked. So, so it was warm, dry great for kids um so that's primarily and obviously there was no television yet and the only other kind of home entertainment was radio which there was limited kind of entertainment it was all bbc it was you know more informative educational not and the cinema had hollywood which was incredibly you know appetizing for for the public um whether it was more of a propaganda machine than the papers or the radio now so i don't know an awful lot about radio and part of the problem with the radio is none of it exists anymore they wiped they just kind of recorded over everything all the time so you can't really study it that easily yeah. um i they were very concerned about film i'd say that in the perception from the government was that film was the thing that was going to influence people and americanize them and it was all going to be terrible so they put a lot of effort into making sure that films portrayed Britain in a particular way, which is where the BBFC, the kind of censorship comes in. Whereas newspapers, although they became a lot more popular as well, you had all the tabloids starting up, there was less of a concern that newspapers would corrupt, um, mm. potentially also linked to the cinemas. A lot of women went to the cinema. The perception was that women didn't read the newspaper or only read the women's pages, which were about fashion and everything else was for men. So I think there was more concern around the cinema potentially having a negative influence. Um, out and out propaganda only happened in the wars, like between the wars, it wasn't a kind of a propaganda machine. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, there was the you know, you can't really show this and you can't really show that. Um, obviously, no sex and things anyway, but obviously, that was the same in America, right? When the, the Hayes Code came in. And your third question was about Hitchcock. Um, he was already established, so Blackmail, the 1929 film, is the one of the first sound films made in the UK, so it was a big deal already. He'd made a number of silent films. So I don't I don't think it's these films that made him that. I think he already was quite kind of prolific and famous, um, able to, you know, have control over his narratives, make films as he as he wanted. Um, because he started in the early 1920s. So I think Kind of 27 28 is probably the time where he developed his own kind of signature style yes was that all the questions okay no that's great uh <laughs> any other uh question i think actually we're running a little bit late but craig told me that we could uh but i think he has in about five minutes there's the big address so i think we should just uh um just part right now and uh thank you very much for beautiful presentations really it was uh, stunning and again i have other questions but i think we should really go um so that we can attend the the the, the next uh, big event uh thank you so much and um and hope to see you on another panel. Um, we have the uh, urban soundscape uh, later on. Uh, Pella is going to be on it. Uh, so you're very welcome to, to join us for that one as well. Um, and that's it. Any other, anything else that uh, anybody wants? An announcement, book, or anything that you'd like to share with us? No? Okay. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much, everybody. And I will send the uh, recording uh, so that you have it. And, uh, and um, an email, of course, will follow up. Um, thank you again. So I'll close the session now. Bye, thank everybody. You, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Sikiru, yeah, Sikiru, uh, I think we should, um, yeah, bonjour, hello, Sikiru. So I, I kind of have a, um, 
Um, I kind of have a, hold on, I want to make sure that I'm not going to lose the chat, but yeah, I'll keep it open. Uh, I do have um, another at 11, I have something else, so I cannot really stay, but maybe we can do it at another day. I'll send you an email if you want, or do you want to do it today? And the says it's getting, yeah. Or uh, I cannot hear you. So maybe let's do by email. Let's make another appointment by email, and maybe we can do a Zoom or Skype. I'll send you something. Is that That's okay? okay? That's okay. That's okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. You absolutely. Much. All right. You're very welcome. So we'll talk thank by you. email and make an appointment. All Sounds right, great. Right. Yeah. Thank take care you. and good <laughs> luck with Israel and everything. So I wish you, you the best. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Let me make sure that I'm gonna. Okay.